for our first analysis of the season, we're going to turn to the RI3D competition held at Kettering University in Michigan this past weekend. So who better to take this on than our man from Michigan? PJ, tell us what happened. All right. So in what I believe was the first of its kind, uh, five RI3D teams from across the state of Michigan all came together uh, at Kettering University this past Sunday to compete against one another in the first taste of Destination Deep Space. Uh, representing Michigan State University, the University of Michigan, Ferris State University, Grand Valley State University, and Kettering University. Uh, the team scrimmaged with their hastily built machines. Um, we'll be checking out the fifth match of the day, which featured all five of these machines on the field. Uh, the sixth robot on the field is 1506's off-season robot from 2018, um, which we'll see turns out to be one of the best robots on the field. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, to begin the match, we see uh, the. Oh, sorry, my screen just died. All right, we see uh, Ferris. <laughs> you see nothing. <laughs> I said, okay, we're back. We see Ferris State University, Michigan State University, and the 1506 fill in in red, and U of M, Kettering, and GVSU are over in blue. Uh, as this match plays out, I think it's really indicative of how a lot of week one matches will look. Uh, we only have one robot that starts out on level two. Uh, the GVSU robot, everyone else just sits at level one. Uh, during Auton, not a ton happens. We have Kettering attempting and missing a hatch, while U of M successfully scores some cargo in the ship during the sandstorm. Uh, so during the sandstorm, all these robots, none of them were autonomous. For what it's worth, they had, <laughs> since they didn't have the curtains, they had the drivers turn around and had their entire driver stations on a table behind them. And Sorry, then when, when, you, when Aut- you say not a, none of them are autonomous, welcome to the 2019 season. Yeah. <laughs> And then they, you know, at the end of Auton, they had to grab their driver's station, turn back around, and set it back on the thing. So that was fun. But so everybody's driving, so we uh, see uh, that's when U, U of M successfully scores some cargo on in their chunk over there. Uh, so at the end of Sandstorm, Blue leads 15-3, to three, uh, which, once again, I think is going to be pretty common. Uh, and then in another thing, F, uh, you'll see FSU get stuck on the corner of the Hab Zone uh, over on red. They're trying to get off, and they just, however, they hit the corner weird. It's the same as the, uh, you'd see teams do it on the platform last year. You saw it on the batter in 2016. You hit that angle wrong, and you're out. Um, so, and then another thing, as this match plays out, you'll see not a lot of action happening. Uh, rockets are completely ignored. Nobody touches the Rockets. Nobody touches a hatch, with the exception of Kettering scores one hatch relatively early in the match and then breaks, and they're dead for the rest of the match. Um, so we have one hatch scored in this entire match. Nobody touches a Rocket. So with the... Um, I know you were saying that you think this is going to be a little bit indicative of what we're going to see in week one, mm-hmm. but um, I... I I find it interesting the teams weren't doing the hatches because I just feel that it's an it's something that you can be done passively. But I guess teams are so used to working with balls, so if you're doing yeah. something in three days, it's easy just to pick up a ball. But yeah, I know. Um, I was talking. I was not at the event, but I was talking to a couple people who were, and they're saying in the first match or two they were having some of the more teams were trying to do hatches, but then uh, they figured out they could just because of the quality of the robots they were playing against, they could just use the hatches, like the pre-populated hatches, and score cargo faster than any of them could do hatches. So from a winning perspective, so strategic, strategically, a lot of them just made the decision not to score hatches because they didn't have to, and it slowed down their game too much. Well, I think that's one really interesting thing about this game that uh, I think is really being overlooked, because this is the first time... Oh, I shouldn't say the first time, because I guess maybe there were other times, but uh, it's the first time that I can really remember where... Forget about your preloads where you're loading objects into the ball. You're loading objects into specific spots on the field, and you're setting up scoring opportunities. So there's a real strategy there pre-match. It's like a little mini game of checkers. I'm not going to call it chess because it's not that complicated. <laughs> it's like a little game of checkers where you're trying to set your alliance up, and our team's going to you know, automatically put panels up there so they can get some extra ball points, or are they going to want to save those? Because if you put up panel slots, then you lose possible panel points. Well, if you put balls in there, the balls are just going to roll out immediately, and then you have access to those balls to score them later on. So I'm thinking that early season matches and matches with more teams that are um, that aren't super super great, we might see more panels scored. But while we, you know, once we get to the high end matches where you have you know three robots on the alliance who can score very competently, you might want to try and maximize your point opportunities by only putting balls out there. So it's uh, interesting to see. Yeah. 
for sure. So that's why it was, like I said, it was interesting to see. I watched a couple of the other matches that to see this develop, like I said, as they just decided at this level of competition, they didn't need to score hatches. Um, so, you know, as we run, you'll see the U of M robot puts up three cargo all behind, two behind the pre-placed hatches, one behind that one hatch that Kettering managed to score before breaking. Uh, 1506 is 2018 robot scores four cargo. Um, and that includes after they got stuck on a piece of cargo for about 20, 25 seconds. So, um, they're, uh, the little, the little red robot that's stuck on the cargo right now, they score the most points of any robot in this match. And they're from 2018. So one thing I do want to talk about there is, um, cargo is going to be an obstacle this year, not just a game piece. It's not just a scoring object and pretty much any year. I just we don't have to go back too far in first history. If you look at the 2016 season, how um, those balls ended up being obstacles. But remember, those balls at least compacted, and robots mm-hmm. can kind of just drive over them. These, you know, someone brought this up in 2004. I know it's like a, a 15 year old reference at this point, but like these balls, like they're they're little orange cuddly landmines to a certain degree. They just look so cute out there. But when you have a lot of them around your robot you are really kind of stuck and you can easily beat yourselves on these things. And even worse with the possession rules, like if you're, if they're surrounding you, you're kind of stuck. You are, you're stuck, you know, like, because you want to be worried about trying to kind of move them out of the way or being judged of being in control of them. So PJ, I'd like to get your opinion on this um, as our refereeing expert. What's the line between just moving a ball that's out of the way, moving a ball out of the way and actually possessing that ball? It's great question. And every year that there's been these possession rules, which has been the last, so it's probably going back to about 2014. I don't think you've been able to possess more than one game piece with the exception of 2015. Um, it's always a judgment call on the refs, but for the most part, the difference between hurting and bulldozing is very fine. Usually it's if you hit it more than a third of the, if you control it and you take it in a direction you want it to go more than a third to a half of the length of the field, you'll probably get called for hurting. Um, That's if it's like on your bumper the whole time and you're pushing it along as opposed to if you hit it once and it flies across the field, like that's not going to, that's a deflection or a bulldoze. Um, And then obviously anything up on your robot's going to be called as possession. But the, I think this year, the hurting versus bulldozing is going to be even trickier to call because um, these balls react differently, like you were saying. The 2016 where they compressed, they didn't really fly away when you hit into them. I mean, they did if you hit them with some force, but these balls, you tap them and they go flying across the field. They're much lighter of a game piece, um, which will be interesting because it's the whole deflection versus hurting versus bulldozing is going to be very interesting to see they haven't had any of the ref training materials come out yet so i can see, can't see if they've uh, if they're going to clarify that for this year cuz these these balls just react differently than any ball from a game that i've refed yeah and it's just it's going to be an issue because mm-hmm. there it, it no matter what there's going to be times when teams are going to score on the cargo ship or going to score on the rocket they already have a game piece and there's going to be a ball directly in front of the bay that they want to score in and they're going to turn and knock that away and it's going to be an intentional movement. And so, you know, I'm just cur- curious as to how referees are yeah. going to set that standard. And then there's also the, like, um, if you get into the discussion of, like, trapping, right, is, is, which I know was huge in 2014. Like, if you kind of have a ball in the corner or it's, like, pressed up against the cargo ship as you're scoring on top of it, are you possessing it? Because nobody else can get it. But, like, you're not doing anything meaningful with it. And in 2014, trapping was huge in that cost. That was a tech file that cost a lot of teams a lot of matches. So it'll be interesting to see where they want us to call things like trapping with these balls. Yeah, well, we got eliminated at a regional for a terrible trapping call. Um, I, I think in 2014, though, at least the trapping calls were so important because there was only one game piece for each alliance. And so, like, if you hear... It's it's so inconsequential if you trap one ball, but so I I would hope that's not a call. But like, hey, it, it, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. But anyways, I'm sorry to digress there with the ref. I just figured since we have PJ on the air, we might as well you know get some of this info. Yeah, no, no, it's interesting for sure, and it's a lot of things that I'm waiting. Usually the ref training materials and ref tests come out a couple weeks into like a week into February. 
So well, one of the reasons be... I also wanted to ask, because I know those ref training materials, you guys aren't really supposed to be talking about them. So I figured if they aren't out yet, at least I can get your opinion. That's without fair. Getting, <laughs> without, without getting you in trouble. Yeah, that's fair, fair. So, um, yeah, then really, other than what I've said, you know, at the end of the match, we have nobody attempts above a level one uh, climb. None of the robots were even capable of a level two climb. Um, other than, I guess, if they would have tried to hit it at a wheelie, like some videos have shown. But uh, so we have a couple level one halves. Um, and our final score of this match, if I counted everything right, there's one cargo I can't fully account for because the view with the cargo ships out of the way. But I believe our final score of the match is blue 29, red 21. And I just, I, we're going to see a lot of scores along this, uh, along those lines, I think, in early matches. Like, this is a low scoring game and it'll be a low scoring game. I think there's going to be a lot of football scores. Um, mm-hmm in that kind of range so that'll be interesting there all right so it looks like we got a couple questions comments from chat i'll get into um at underscore 830 since uh said since rps did not matter at this competition and no one can hit level three there was little reason to go for the rocket uh that's fair um i I want to i want to say i want to add something to that because that's such a important statement Mm -hmm. since rps did not matter at this competition there was little reason to go for the rocket. When else do RPs not matter this season? That would be in eliminations. In the elimination rounds. And so this is one of the things, you know, strategy people out there, this is really important to pay attention to. If you haven't figured this out already, this year's game is going to change drastically from qualification rounds to elimination rounds. And here's why. Some years when there's been ranking point incentives, there's been a point bonus to go with those ranking points in the elimination rounds to kind of make up for them. But there is no point bonus associated with it. So the rocket is so valuable in qualification rounds because the one RP associated with filling an entire rocket. There is no reason to fill an entire rocket in the elimination rounds because there's no point incentive for it. I mean, you might want to fill it because other spots are full, but otherwise it's not. There's, there's no added bonus in going high. As such, teams may want to work on the faster, easier cycles by staying low and focusing on the cargo ship. And so this is going to cause a dramatic shift in play. And teams who were highly valued in the qualification rounds because of their ability to go high may not be as valued in the elimination rounds because you just want like the best low score. At some point, we're going to get to the point where maybe all the low spots are going to fill. And that's, that's even a debate if all the low spots can fill in a high-end match. Because we're talking about 24 spots with three teams, and you're talking eight cycles per team plus, you know, like it's, it, it's dicey there. But let's just remember, for teams who still are fumbling with their design, they're not sure what they want to do, the low goals are so, so important. Like we thought they were important in games like 20, like you look at 2016, Stronghold. Were low goal, like you could still get the RP by just going low, but there was a there were, high goals were worth 250% more than a low goal in terms of points. So there was huge incentive to go high. This year, they're worth the same amount. And in the Elims, where the RP doesn't matter, like going low. So, like, if you're a team and you're coming to this point, it's like, man, we got to sacrifice something on our robot right now. We're just not going to be able to get this all done. Sacrifice going high because going low is so critical to being an elimination superstar in this game. And I think that we always look at FRC games. You're always like, we have to do the highest, biggest challenge out there. But it's about doing your analysis. And the highest, biggest challenge has the same point value in the elimination rounds as the other challenges. In quals, I get why it's important because you want if you want to control that RP. But this is a really a year, and we're coming off a year last year where teams who specialized and built switch bots kind of struggled in the long run because they kind of got just like they, their value wasn't really needed, especially because so many scale bots could downgrade to the switch and do that really well. So you might as well take the scale bot for that flexibility. But I think this is a game where teams who are highly optimized for going low have such huge, huge value in the elimination rounds. Yeah. It's, I know someone said it in chat and I've thought the same thing where it's uh it's the the RP is how you control your own destiny, right? That's how you seed first. But the first overall pick is probably going to be the best, potentially, you know, your best logo, your best climber in the competition, who may be ranked twentieth at the event, not twentieth if they're the best at cargo. But you know, they'll be ranked lower. But it's it's a matter of whether you want to control your own destiny or if you want to be picked first. 
Yeah, and I just remember, like, yeah, if you decide to try and control your own destiny, just remember, like, lots of teams are going to be doing that. So, like, unless you're going to be awesome at going high, you still may not control your own destiny. So this is just, like, the whole, like, strategic design, stay simple sort of advice for everyone that most people are going to ignore anyways. But, hey, I just wanted to throw it out there. Uh, another question that we had. Oh, I lost the questions, PJ. Yamo221, uh, I found him. Why do the robot in three-day matches almost seem incoherent like the drivers have never driven before? That's um, got to be sarcastic, right? Please tell yeah. me that's sarcastic. Because, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, the robots were built in three days. This is not exactly like they were spending lots of time at the practice field fine-tuning yeah. their skills. So. Yeah. So these people haven't touched, you know, robot sticks in three, four years if they've ever driven on their team. Um, so a question about possessing MW McLean uh, as spin in place to move cargo randomly away. Would that avoid hurting bulldozing? Well, bulldozing is legal um, to clarify. But yes, yeah, if you're like spinning and cargo all bounces off you, that's legal. That's just bulldozing or deflecting, depending on who you ask. But either one is legal. Um, so, that, you know, if you had cargo around, you just do like a, a 360 bounce it all away that should be completely legal okay and uh, uh, next one I, that i want to take how valuable do you think level three climbs will be if one team gets up there then another team just has to park to get the ranking point that's from uh lip 737 or ljp 737 that that's a really good point um the level three climb is super valuable first of all 12 points in this game is huge 12 points is approximately worth about four or five uh cycles in this game. And so if, even if you're talking about teams doing super fast cycles, a lot of teams are talking about 10-second cycles, which seems crazy to me. But like, if you're talking, that's still 40 to 50 seconds of the match. And if you're talking about like 15, 20-second cycles, we're talking up to like, like just you know, like almost half the match. So level three climb is valuable there. In terms of the ranking point, it gets you 80% of a ranking point. For example, the ability to just just go high on the rocket only gets you 33% of a rocket uh, ranking point. And that involves you doing it four times with four cycles. So the level three climb is hugely valuable, both in um, qualifications and eliminations. But man, is it a hard engineering challenge. This is not like hanging of the other years of what we've seen. The closest probably is the level three pyramid climb in 2013 in terms of difficulty. I don't think it's that hard. It, oh, I'm sorry. I don't need to say I don't think. I know it's not that hard, <laughs> but this is a difficult challenge, which is going to, if you're going to do it, you will have to make a trade-offs on other parts of your robot, or at least trade-offs in your build season. This is not something like the hangers in 2017, where you could just slap a bar on your robot, throw a burst planetary, wrap it with Velcro, and you're good. This is not like that at all. It takes, it's going to take some real room on your robot and it's going to take some ingenuity to figure out how to do this and it's not something you can just drive train around it like you can with the level two so hugely important yep and then uh in response to the first alliance pick coming from yamo 221 uh it depends on the competition too because if you're at a competition with say 10 to 12 rookie teams a few teams with the decent high goal for the ranking point will most likely be an alliance partner um, yeah, I mean, everything always depends on the event and what you're picking. I'm just yeah. thinking more potentially high-level events. Also, if, if you're in an event, a low-level event with 10 to 12 rookie teams, yeah. even if you can score the high goal, it's going to be hard to get that ranking point because you're not going to be getting the support from your partners. I know a lot of people are out there like, yo, I'm going to solo a rocket. First of all, that sounds dirty. That's, like, <laughs> uncomfortable. But but secondly, like, that's, that's, real, that's 12 cycles. Like, yeah. that... I know everyone's talking about how short the cycles are in this game, but cycle length is not the determining factor. It's lineup time, uh, both on the intake and on the release. So um, just just being able to go high is not guaranteeing you ranking points in the same way but being able to do a level three climb is because you need a lot more support from your partner than just a team to climb up that platform. I've talked to five, six teams who are like, yeah, we'll be able to solo that rocket. No problem. I'm like, okay. Yeah, they, they, we've got to come up with better terminology for that. Like, that's true. <laughs> well, I, I'm, just, that's, I'm not comfortable with this. We'll work on that one. We need your help to keep fun loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers keeping fun loud, live, and independent. Pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now.